Our guest in this segment is attorney at law Stephen Skinner from the aforementioned Skinner Law Firm. Stephen, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Thank you for having me. We've done a couple segments on artificial intelligence uh, earlier this morning. And I'm and wondering. Deep fake. And deep fake. Yeah. yeah. Are, 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 is there any concern in the legal profession about artificial intelligence and AI replacing some of the work that you do? Well, I think that I'm certainly not concerned that lawyers are going to lose their job because it requires a huge amount of uh, of judgment. But there is a lot of talk about how AI can help and and make uh, find a lot of efficiencies, just the same way it would anywhere else. I certainly, um, you know, I have one of my support staff who has been experimenting with it, um, and it's it's been quite helpful. But you have to, you can't just take it at face value. You have to be thoughtful. Yeah, I would, I would guess that there's some document preparation AI might be able to assist with, but then you'd need someone to obviously read through it to make sure it was factual. Well, you can imagine, of course, I don't do, say, real estate closings, mm-hmm. but you could imagine that a real estate practice, you could have an AI where you just gave them some basic information, and it generated all the documents that you were going to need um, to do. I mean, you were not very far off from being able to, to um, do a lot of those tasks. I actually have a friend who is a mortgage broker who has been able to reduce their staff significantly anyway. Um, and because many of the tasks are not, um, they, you, you, they don't require full-time attention, and you can sort of outsource some of them. So um, you, you can see where AI could easily uh, assist. Um, I think, you know, I'm, I, th- this is obviously me as a person, I think that there are going to be huge opportunities, and they're going to be a lot more jobs created ultimately because of AI being fully developed, but we're, 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 we're a long way off. What about with this DocuSign business? You know, it's when I bought my house not too long ago, I've signed a number of other kinds of contracts that I never actually, there's no wet signature. All I do is I, I click the okay and then approve the signature that's not my signature. It seems to me that would be very easily faked. Well, uh, I mean, switching over to that, you know, all of that's fairly heavily regulated. Um, every state has to adopt the legislation in order to make DocuSign and and, um, and similar companies um, be legal. But what, what you have when it is signed, you not only have your IP address from wherever you are sitting um, has been confirmed, right? So if if it's at some place odd if you're if it's being signed in in Russia for example it it's going to be caught it's not going to be permitted and then there's going to be an algorithm that's actually checking to make sure it makes sense so there we we have a system and we use it every single day and we we get the information printed out about all of the um, the IP address, and so that's a confirmation of it. Oh, you know more about that than I do. I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah. Well, we can't. I mean, we we're not going back. You know, we mm-hmm. just you know in this modern age, it's it's a little bit like, you know, who's using a check and who's using cash and who is not, and there's a cutoff date for when you talk to. Gen Z about checks, they don't understand what you're talking about. No, they don't. You know? yeah. <laughs> That's true of counting yeah. change yeah. also. Yeah. <laughs> my, my son came to me the other day and he said, I, I have to write a check to somebody for they only take a check. What do I do? <laughs> you don't have any checks? He said, no, I don't even know what they look like. Yeah. Uh, Steve, this is Bill. You use the term, going back to AI, I uh, use the term assist. I, I can see real value in AI assisted. What scares me is it's designed to learn and adapt, to continue to learn, continue to adapt, and it's going to exceed. It's sometimes going to get out of the traces of a system, and uh, and I, there's going to be some real strengths and some attributes of that. That this is, but the, this is where I see the risk when they continue to learn and to adapt. Yeah, 
and and I agree, and we're just gonna have to, you know, our our poets, and I use that term to to mean writers and and creative people, have been thinking about this for for fifty years, for a hundred years, and the, you know they've predicted some some scary things would happen, um, and you know we're we're gonna go through this. But I could I could tell you today, I sort of always have an unlimited amount of research. Uh, and legal issues that I want done, for me to be able to say to an AI, you know, give me a memo on whether, um, you know, horses can trespass in North Dakota and whether there's a cause of action, and it generates a 10-page memo for me to just look at, um, e- even though it's not something that's critically important to anything that I'm doing, but it might be helpful, you know, the ability to to do that in an unlimited way is pretty extraordinary, um, and will it will make my end product better because it it doesn't have to be um, sort of handcrafted. Now, if you were going to submit it to a court, you 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 would have to fully vet it and and make sure that everything is correct. Um, but you know, it's it's a it's definitely a useful starting point. Appreciate your perspective on that. That's uh, very uh, more than I knew about that going into the conversation. So good stuff. Uh, Jim Justice, governor of West Virginia, on March 22, signed Senate Bill 674, establishing the West Virginia First Foundation into state law. The new foundation is meant to promote cooperation and more bang for the buck. It is to include a governing board with expertise and regional representation. The board includes five members from different regions appointed by the governor and approved by the state Senate. Six more members are to be named by regions of local governments. Board members are also charged with appointing a panel with expertise in substance abuse treatment, mental health, law enforcement, pharmacology, finance, and health care policy and management. The expert panel is supposed to provide guidance on strategies for abating the opioid epidemic in communities around the state. Stephen, this is all part of the opioid settlements uh, that uh, we've been talking about for the last couple of years in West Virginia and elsewhere. Well, and, and your keen listeners will not be surprised by anything that you just said because we've been talking about it for this entire time. And that this is actually the um, basically the memorandum of understanding that we negotiated, I think, a year and a half ago um, in Martinsburg, um, by the way, and um, with all of the local governments and the attorney general. So this was our side of what we needed to do in order to start settling cases. And this just puts the, the legislature's um, uh, print on it and the governor's approval. And now what you're going to see is we're going to be moving forward. We are, uh, I think we're at a point now where for the most part, and it's very hard to be um, always say something with 100% um, certainty, but we're really in the, at the end. And we have one trial that's scheduled to happen in June. That's against Kroger. Um, they're a holdout and, and don't want to contribute, um, which is fine. Um, that's, we don't take on any of these cases unless um, we are willing to go all the way and take them to trial. So that is scheduled for June. But other than that, we've essentially um, uh, settled all of the the cases and in our county councils, county commissioners, and city councils uh, across the state have been signing on to the individual settlements um, really for the last year. And so the money is starting to flow in, and that money is in a bank account growing right now. Um, and we're looking for how we're going to distribute that money approximately 75% of the net money is going to go into the foundation, um, and it will then be spent from there. Um, You know, if you are paying attention and you realize how much money is ultimately going to go into that foundation, um, you got to be creating a strategy for how you can, um, how the 
foundation can assist in your community. Um, you know, you have communities and counties across the state who have been very active in dealing with the opioid epidemic for a long time, Berkeley County probably being the leader in the state who's been doing just an extraordinary job for such a long time. And, and you know, all, all credit needs to go to the Berkeley County Council and, of course, for, uh, former Councilor uh, Copenhaver for really leading the way in the state. And you compare that with other places, other counties, other cities who have really not been able to do anything because they're so strapped for resources. Um, so some of that money is going to be spent across the state through the foundation, but also the other 25% of the money is going to go directly to the local governments to help them in what we call abatement, which is how to, to try to stop the epidemic, treat the epidemic, prevent the epidemic from spreading. Um, there are, are many, many details, and what you have, the, what the governor signed, what the bill does, isn't really much more than what we've already agreed to. So there's, there's actually a whole lot more to be worked out. There, um, there's a lot of work happening behind the scenes to get this set up. You know, one of the big questions is going to be, um, you know, who's going to represent each region? That's a that's something that the each region is going to 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 face here very shortly. Um, and you know, the Eastern Panhandle is is one of the eight regions. So we're, we will have somebody, and and that's something that that really I, on behalf of my clients here in the Eastern Panhandle, insisted on that we have on that board the, the accountability back to the regions because we don't want to be punished in the eastern panhandle because of our um, ability to fund things um, along the way because we make those decisions to, to succeed over here in, in creating the kind of programs that are, are, are necessary. So. We're going to have that accountability. The other thing is in the formula of spending for the first seven years, there's, there's a certain amount of money that has to be spent regionally. So we wouldn't want the foundation, you know, who is, uh, is not going to be based in the Eastern Panhandle, much like anything else in West Virginia. We, we do not want it to just spend uh, in southern West Virginia. Um, it, it has to spend everywhere because there, there, it's nothing is unique to Southern West Virginia here. Um, we had just as much of a problem per capita as almost anywhere else, and and so we have these sort of guarantees in the foundation to make sure that we're going to get our fair share. And of course, um, the local governments will get their direct um, payments, which will help but are, are not nearly enough to do everything that, that they want or to pay, for example, in Berkeley County, to pay them back for what they've invested. So it's, it's an exciting time, but for many people, this is just the beginning of the process. Um, for, for a lot of us lawyers, we're, we're, we're heading towards the end of our role in it, and we'll hand it off to the professionals who are experts in how to um, uh, deal with the epidemic. Bill. Yeah, uh, Steve, uh, for uh, Senate Bill 674, which is signed by the governor, uh, the 25 percent, I have two questions. For the 25 percent, the local, that goes for abatement, how specific uh, is the language there? Um, I guess my question is, is there any room for the, a local county to do some mischief, to misuse the money than what had been originally proposed? The second question is, going to the 75 percent for the foundation, uh, are the skill, what are the skill sets required for the board members? So the uh, your first question, um, I mean, I, I obviously, you know, anything, any amount of money 
going to any government um, has to be um, have some kind of oversight. But one of the things that's built into the settlement agreements and into the 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 statutory language is the uh, what we call the guardrails, and there are significant guardrails to make sure that uh, the funds are spent in such a way that they go to uh, opioid abatement. So now, you know, every it, it's it, everything is subject to debate, um, and as we know, some some governments are better than other governments. Um, I mean, that's the nature of of the beast. But in in place and agreed to are those guardrails. There is a list, and I don't have it in front of me, of the qualifications for the governor governor's appointments. And the person who will be the executive director has some very specific um, uh, requirements for that role. Um, including, you know, significant experience and, you know, also in managing vast sums of money. So um, the regional representatives have no experience requirements because they don't, that's not their necessarily their role. They play more of a political role to, to um, have oversight over um, how the money is being distributed uh, in a in a fair and equitable way across the state, so you sort of have a half professional board, half regional board, um, and of course there there will be a lots of professional staff. When you use the word abatement, is that abatement? When you use the word abatement, is that abatement of the addiction or abatement of the availability of the uh, opioids? So. We use uh, – lawyers use abatement to talk about abating the nuisance. Um, the, the basis for why um, uh, these suits were brought was to stop what, what is thought of as a nuisance uh, under in, – in the law. And the only way you, you generally deal with a nuisance is – through abating it. Like, the question is, how do you solve the problem created by the nuisance? So abatement is very general, but it includes stopping the problem. So that's typically a law enforcement, but it's also dealing with the problem, which we then go into the court system. And for example, in Berkeley County, um, day report um, services towards dealing with addiction um, and then obviously there's going to be a lot of prevention and education. So it's, abatement is a very general term and it's, it, it's, uh, it's, while it comes from the legal world, it's, it's really a, a good, um, descriptor of how this, how the, uh, guardrails are being put up to deal with the opioids. So at the at the locality level, that 25% of, of the payment, which is significant cash, does it come with prescribed approved uses? I mean, just off the top of my head, with such a general uh, definition of abatement, it could be treatment, it could be jobs training, it could be you know, physically you know, taking care of the medical aspects of, of addiction. Is all of that on the board and, and more, or are there prescribed ways to spend this money? Well, it's not they're, – they're not specifically laid out. You have to spend X percentage of the money on this or that, but it does it, – it basically – there are guardrails to that, – that are for the spending of the money at the local level. And, and there will be reporting necessary. So there will be checks and balances. I, I know that there's – this is kind of a big top – starting to become – a topic nationally, and West Virginia is going to be one of the states where there will be transparency um, and reporting of how the money is used. So that is something that um, that um, is it is fairly clear, but it's it's also broad because some of uh, accounting in Southern West Virginia 
might need to do something a lot different than Berkeley County or Jefferson County or Morgan County just because of the nature. I mean, it, it could be there. I mean, there are plenty of places you don't have any sort of day report system and they like that could eat up their entire budget. I mean, you can imagine also that jail bills are sort of a big deal for the county. I mean, in Berkeley County, is, the, the taxpayers of Berkeley County are paying for almost all of the bills of the regional jail. And they, they even cover the, the bills for um, the city. So, like, those, much of that, uh, of the increase in jail bills over the last 15 years has been related to opioids. So some of that will fall within the, the guardrails. Um, but it, it is specifically prescribed. Steve, is uh, does uh, SB 674 have a provision for audits in addition to the guardrails? Will there be audits provided? Um, I don't know that there's a, and, and I don't know that I'm not an expert on the bill, but it's it's relatively minimal. There is reporting, but I don't know that there are audits. But that's that's something that that I should look up and know. Yeah, because I, uh, we all go into something like this with the best of intentions, uh, and but there are other pressures that arise. And you mentioned the jail bill, and I can well imagine some county commissioners finding a way. They think in their own mind, legitimacy, they can use this new money to pay for the jail bills and that's just one example there's probably others so i i'd be curious to see if there was in fact an audit that would come back and and monitor uh, what they how they're using the money well i just to be clear there's specific contemplation that this money can cover uh, jail bills um and I, I think greatly so that's that's been for many county commissions one of their number one light items and one of the biggest expenses. So, so to be able to have some relief from that so that then they could free up other money that they shouldn't have had to spend on it um, will, will be of great use. I mean, I, I, I hear what you're saying, but we also have to understand the pressure that this has put on local governments for such a long time, and it's redirected their, their, their spending um, at a time when they didn't necessarily want to um, spend. They certainly didn't want to have to spend on dealing with the opioid crisis, but they have. Attorney Stephen Skinner has been our guest here on the program. And, uh, Stephen, you said this pretty much wraps up the lawyer's end of things, except for the the Kroger case. There's nothing else out there that may emerge from this uh, legally? Well, there are some minor things. and I mean, you... you, it's very difficult to describe even almost to other lawyers how massive this litigation is and how many how many different entities have been involved in it. You just have to think about the thousands of counties and thousands of cities and then uh, also the thousands of distributors and manufacturers who have been involved in this and and um, drug sellers so it it's when I say it's over I mean it's we're, we're nearly there we're, we're nearly there but there are a lot of there are a lot of details you know I don't my job is not going to be over anytime soon but the the for West Virginia we have basically reached the end the, the end point for for all intents and purposes so now it comes to to dealing with the money, which is uh, sort of a new and happy problem. Well, uh, on my behalf, I appreciate uh, you making sense of this and making it understandable over the years that we've been talking about this in regards to this opioid issue. Because I can remember the first interviews we did in which you were talking about which local municipalities and county governments were joining this case and which were not. And I can't even remember what year that conversation began. Well, I've been working on this for, I, I think, seven years. Well, that, that would be it. 
Yeah, that's <laughs> and haven't been paid yet either. <laughs> oh my! <laughs> Something else. So yeah, yeah. your your uh, your community service, Steve, is well recognized <laughs> and much appreciated. <laughs> Let, let's have you mention Stephen Skinner's name to get your free rate on test kit today. By the way, Stephen, thank you so much, man, for uh, like I said, seven years of explaining this to every, all of us and uh, helping it make sense. It's great to be on, and, and we'll we'll come back on sometime soon to, to, to talk a little bit more. Absolutely. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Rob. Thank you all. Attorney Law Stephen Skinner and the uh, Skinner Law Firm. You can find out more about them at uh, skinnerfirm.com 